Hi and welcome to NBC Connect. I'm Adi Mihalcay and our guest today is Silvia Haskwitz. Silvia is a certified trainer in nonviolent communication and an assessor. She's also a registered dietitian and the author of Eat by Choice, Not by Habit. In her book, she combines her two passions for food and nutrition and nonviolent communication. She lives in Tucson, uh, Arizona with her precious uh, therapy dog, Rico, and her beloved uh, husband, Tim. We invited Sylvia to find out more about her journey in nonviolent communication and how we can make uh, conscious choices when it comes to food. Hello, Sylvia. Thank you so much for being here with us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Mm. Sylvia, I met you during the IIT in Romania in 2015, and I enjoyed being around you from the first moment. I appreciated your presence and state of calmness uh, your clarity in explanations uh, during uh, the workshops and also your playfulness. You had some moments with another trainer in our um, time here. So I'm really, really happy to see you again. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm remembering that with lots of, lots of joy as well. I can't believe it's been 2015. Wow, it's amazing. Yes. Yeah. A long time ago. Mm -hmm. With all our guests, uh, we start from the beginning of their journey in nonviolent communication. So my first question is, how did you discover nonviolent communication? What were you doing at the time you discovered it? And also, what was your first reaction to it? Mm. Mm, sweet memories. Um, what was happening is I was a nonprofit director in San Francisco for an organization and I shared an office with a woman named Kim Allison. And I liked the way she communicated. I, and I said, what, what are you doing? Because whatever you're doing, I want for myself. So she told me about this man, Marshall Rosenberg, and she had studied um, for social work at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, United States. And she took one class from him and she was totally excited and hooked. So she took every class she could from him and she told me that he was coming to the Bay Area where we both lived. So I said, well, I wanna come. Where is he coming and when? So she told me all the details and then I told my partner and said, we have to do this. And he said, yes, but he didn't really mean it. And we were getting ready for a cross country bicycle ride. And so the way that I got him to go with me is I knew he'd be happy to ride his bicycle to the workshop and it was 25 miles from where we lived. So he agreed to come, but he didn't really want to go. So when the alarm clock went off that morning, he turned it off and I didn't know it. So we ended up, he still wanted to ride the bicycle, even though I knew we'd be very late and I was really mad. So we were on this tandem bicycle and I was ready to cut it in half. And when we finally got to the workshop two hours late, Marshall pulled out the puppets. He had these giraffe and jackal puppets and he pulled them out and he started role playing what happened to us on the bicycle. And he had all the words accurately. And I was shocked. How did he know? Was he there? But at that moment, the turning point for me was to know that it wasn't about, it was only about feelings and needs. It wasn't about being right or wrong. And my whole life, whenever I was in conflict, I was always trying to prove myself right. So it was liberation. It was a relief. It was amazing joy to know that it was just his needs and mine. And I was openly curious about his experience rather than judging. So that was, that began my incredible journey. So the next, I think the next day I started practicing and I started a practice group and I said to Kim, I'd love to sponge, be a sponge around you and learn everything that I can from you. So how about if I set up workshops all over the Bay Area and when the businesses ask you to come and do it, I'll just come and be a sponge with you and I'll learn all I can. So I learned from her for two years. She was my mentor. We started what now is Bay NBC. And we sort of planted those seeds. There were six of us at the same time that started. And we had a, um, a commitment to each other that we wouldn't leave a meeting until there was connection. So I learned a lot from just being together from that whole process. And then I started hosting Marshall and started organizing for him to come back. Mm. A, a lot of things going on in that, in, in that period. It seems like it, mm. it was really rich in, uh, mm. in aliveness. It was very rich. And I went back to school to get my master's degree in communication after I met Marshall. 
because mm -hmm. I realized I really wanted more of this in my life. And what was fun was everything I did for my master's degree was around nonviolent communication. So every project that I did, every speech I gave, it was all connected. So it, it gave me a structure to go deeper into my learning as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in which relationship did you want to apply MVC the most? And what were the easiest and the most challenging parts to, uh, to apply? I think my interpersonal relationships, I really wanted it for. So I was in a relationship that um, at that point, I think I was married to this man and I realized that we just, we weren't communicating in a way that I was really enjoying. So for me, it also gave the clarity to say, it's not working for us and we could have a giraffe divorce. So it was actually a really positive, even though it wasn't an ending that we were initially both happy about. I think in the end, we both realized that um, we both really had a very different desire. We both had a need for communication, but the amount and the way was so incredibly different and opposed that it made it really being together difficult, even though we really cared for each other and loved each other. So we had a really sweet ending, and I don't think that would have happened without nonviolent communication. We brought together all our friends and family and, and said goodbye in a really connected way. Wow, that's powerful to me mm. because I, I know people around me who, who divorced and uh, there is so much pain left behind, um, left between them. And when, when I uh, hear your story, I want to celebrate that it, there is another way to, to let go of a relationship. Mm. Yeah, okay. it was very sweet. And this is where the play came in, too. So Jean Morrison, who's another certified trainer, um, she came. We, we, had, we rented a place in Stinson Beach in California. And she came to the event. And she brought a bunch of old gifts wrapped up from, from a used store and gave them back to people kind of in fun. You know, so like you give presents, we, we gave presents back to them. And we had, um, we had a healer and we had groups of people kind of gathering separately and saying what we'd miss about the relationship and what we celebrated. So it was really a giraffe divorce and we actually wrote a little booklet about doing it as well. It was very sweet, very, very sweet. And we're still connected today. We don't talk all that often, but when we do, it's, it's very heartfelt and open. Yeah. You are one of the uh, initial 20 certified trainers that Marshall trained. What contributed to your decision to pursue this path? And how did your life or routine uh, change when uh, you started the certification process? Um, I think after I really got connected to the value for me, um, I don't think there was anything else I could have done. I mean, it felt very compelling. Uh, when I was 15, I was in one of these classes in high school where you talked about how you wanted to live your life, what you wanted to do. And I had put together a whole piece about um, communication and parenting and nutrition. So all these pieces that really guided how I wanted to live my life. And when I met Marshall and saw his work in action, I knew that this was, if I could have designed something when I was 15, this would have been it. So it was very it was instantaneous. It was like love at first sight and there was nothing else I could do. So it was, um, it was very powerful. And it's, it's not less powerful today after almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. Have you done something specific in the period of, uh, of the certification process? The certification process at that time was very different than it is today. Oh, um, it was more of Marshall saying, you're ready, you know, after a certain period of time. So there were 20 of us that gathered in San Diego. And I believe it was during that time. And it was after I was very intensely studying and working uh, with Kim and offering my own practice sessions uh, that I became certified. So it was probably about two or three years into my practice of nonviolent communication in a very intense way. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really, it was... It was kind of a mutual readiness and 
kind of a knowing that this would be my path for the rest of my life. So no matter where I was when I was sharing it, I was going to be on a continuous learning path. Yeah. How was your personal experience when you started introducing MVC to people who came to your trainings? Did you have any fears or doubts? Um, not about the work. I really trusted that the work was really powerful. So if I just got out of the way, uh, the magic would happen itself. Um, some of the people that have um, worked with me have said that it's an energy and an energy psychology people will notice that the energy comes through us. It's not from us. So that's to me how it is. It's a gift that's coming through me. It's not really me. Um, so if I get out of the way and just am present with people, uh, then the work does its, does its magic on its own. And it's really, to me, just a heart, heart opening. So how do I open my heart to you? And how do I allow your heart to open to me if it wants to? Yeah. And about the uh, becoming a, an assessor, how, uh, how did you decide that? Mm. I struggled with that a bit because it, um, it wasn't something I connected to at first. It took me a couple years to say yes. And I said yes, because the integrity of the work is so important to me. And so I really thought long and hard about it. And I realized when I first came into this community in Tucson, where I now live for the last 19 years, that there were people um, that were sharing this work. It wasn't the same work that I remembered learning from Marshall. It was very different. And I was worried about what people were getting. And in fact, one woman that came to me several years ago said, I didn't know this was what nonviolent communication was. So who she learned it from and where she learned it and how it was presented was really different than the way that I was presenting it. So I was just worried about the integrity and really wanting to honor his work going forward the best that I could in the way that I learned it. Yeah. Uh, I guess like everything in life, uh, there are pros and cons of uh, being an NBC trainer and assessor. What do you love most about what you're doing and what you do not enjoy so much in this mm -hmm. process? Mm -hmm. I like the question. Um, what do I like most? There's nothing I can think of that I'd rather be doing. So that's what I really like. That it's something that I wake up in the morning and I'm excited about. Um, I guess the hardest part is kind of right now, the whole new future process and not knowing where it's going, not really having a be an ending date of like by when this is going to be uh, in place. And if not, is there an alternative? Um, kind of what's showing up in the network right now is a little troubling. There's, there's been a lot of disconnects for me. Uh, a lot of people that um, I don't think we collectively as a group are living the NBC consciousness as much as I would like myself and others. It's, um, there's a lot more enemy images going on and a lot more separation and groups kind of splintering. When I first went to my first IIT um, as a facilitator in 96, one of the things I loved was there was no clicks. Every person really had a desire to know every other person. It was just an amazing experience. People didn't know each other at that point. It was, you know, fairly new. One of the, one of the first IITs. And so there was just a general openness. And that's the place I'd love to get back to. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And you described so well what, uh, what I feel and what is going on in me regarding this process of transitioning from what uh, the organization was and uh, towards what they want to do now. Mm -hmm. The other yes. thing I worry about with New Future is when something's broken, I can understand fixing it, but I'm not sure what was broken. So I'm not sure the energy from which was coming, um, what's happening. It seems to me that a lot of systems that are wanting to be put into place are putting into place with different names, although they're things that we've already been doing. So I'm just, I'm not clear. And no matter how much I try to get clear, I'm still not clear. So um, there's something missing for me. And I worry the energy with which a new process is coming because it seemed that the people that brought forth this process were very angry about what was happening. And I worry when something comes from a place of anger that I'm not 
I'm not sure that that's the place in which I want to play together. Yeah. Uh, I I agree, especially because I am in the certification process and I'm not sure towards what I'm going on. So I'm in a in a place where I where I just share Marshall's work as much as I can because I wasn't lucky enough to to meet him. So I know him only from books, or videos, and uh, audios, uh, and I'm. I'm doing my best to stick to his work and to share it as um, as much as I can and as um, uh, as as it is, not adding too much from my own experience or what I've learned besides it. Yeah. So you you have a lot of experience as a trainer as and uh, as an assessor. And uh, my question is, what is something that comes up uh, more often than the rest when you speak with people who seek your support and uh, guidance as a trainer or assessor? I would say the hardest part is how do I live this process? You know, it's, it's not so hard to teach it, to share it, um, to learn it, uh, but somehow the doing, it's easy to get off track and it's easy to go back to my old habits, uh, go back to what might be habitual. So how do I live it every day? And how do I not beat myself up when I don't live it? Like, how do I get back on track? And how do I use those skills that I know I have to get back on track? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, are you referring to, to forgiveness also? You'd like people to forgive themselves if they go off track and to come back to the process? I would say not worrying about getting it right. You know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. And can I get back to that consciousness that's precious to me? Like, is that a choice that I want to make? And if I do, yeah, can I give myself some, some space around regrets? I have some regrets, but instead of beating myself up. And so whether that's with NVC or with food or with anything, can I just allow my humanness that I allow so much oftentimes with others? Can I allow that with myself? Yes. Also, uh, I guess when, uh, when you want to stay on track, um, daily rituals um, are welcome. And I remember that um, I took this, uh, one of, of these rituals from you at the, at the, at the IIT in Romania, um, you told the participants about your habit to share the high and low of the day with your husband. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like talking about this practice with, with uh, our audience too and uh, to share what impact uh, it had on you and uh, your relationship? Mm, thank you. Yeah, that's so fun you remember that. Yeah, it's something that we do really regularly. It's kind of a way to say, you know, what need am I connected to? What worked today and what didn't? So it's just kind of a shorthand for NBC, and I find it it's a place that anybody can play with. Um, so I do it with my mom, I do it with whoever's wanting to play with me at the table. And often food is a place of connection. You know, it's a place we often get together three times a day. So it's a time to check in. So it's a way, it really is a check-in process, just a kind of a, an abbreviated check-in process. How am I? And those are the two questions that Marshall often asks about with NBC. You know, how, are, how am I and how can I make life more wonderful for me and for you? So it's, it's really a part of that. And when I share, there's the connection opens up and we learn something about each other. So it's, it's really a way to stay present. And it's also a way just to express ourselves when maybe we need to just share what's happening inside. And also, it, it, it doesn't matter if the other person knows MVC or not. This is what I like uh, about this exercise. My, my, part, my partner doesn't know MVC and doesn't want to learn MVC. So uh, this was the most natural way to, sh to share uh, our day and to connect. And yes, at the table, eating. And uh, I would like to, to talk now about your book, Eat by Chosen 
if by choice, not by, by habit. Um, the um, the whole the whole title says practical skills for creating a healthy relationship with your body and food and i loved it so much i read it after the iit and also i read it before this interview to uh, to take some uh, notes from it and to ask some questions from it if you if you are willing to answer the the one thing that uh, that uh, struck me in the book was uh, let me get it clear because it's a quote and I want to, to say mm -hmm. it exactly. Many of us are habitually at war with our bodies, treating them in ways we would not want to be treated or in ways we would never consider treating anyone else. End of quote. Why do you think we have this, uh, this habit of being at war with our bodies? There's so many shoulds in societies about how in society about how we look and our parents have probably started there. They wanted us to belong, to be accepted. So if we would eat in ways that they didn't enjoy or that they thought might bring judgment or eating the, the foods that they thought would bring judgment or we looked bigger than they were happy about. So there were so many shoulds around food. You know, you shouldn't eat that. That's not good for you. You should eat this. A lot of it was about parents' competency because they wanted to be sure their children thrive and survive. So it was really, the intention was really from their heart. Um, but the impact was very, very powerfully painful uh, to many of their children. And I've got lots of stories about parents that would you know, say, you're, you're too fat, don't eat that chocolate. So that message is, is pretty profound in a young person and even an older person when somebody hears from somebody they care about, somebody that they're really dependent on for their emotional well-being, tells them messages like that. Those are hardwired in at a young age and they impact for the rest of their life. My, my nephew, my sister was very into healthy food and she would only allow her child to eat certain amounts of sugar, certain amounts of grams of sugar. And he's now in his 30s and he's still fighting her. So we've had conversations even recently you know, is it, is it time for you to look at yourself now? I get that your, your, your autonomy button was being pressed with your mom. You really wanted a choice when you were a kid. You didn't want to be restricted by how, much, how many grams of sugar. Um, but now you're still fighting her and you're in your 30s and you have a child of your own. Is this the path you want to choose? Is this supporting your own health and well-being? Sugar is a very important topic, and uh, uh, if I remember well, it's one of the first topics in your book. We also had uh, a workshop, Salil, uh, Salil's workshop, before uh, New Year's Eve with resolutions, and this was one of the things that occurred most, people wanting to quit sugar. In your opinion, what's best, to stop at once, to, reduce, to just reduce the amount, or to change it with healthier versions? like fruit or other um, things? Yeah, sugar's like a drug. I mean, it really does have the same impact. It's one of the hardest things to, to change. So, you know, people have different ideas. Some people like to stop cold turkey and, and just stop. Uh, and some people like to reduce. I would say there's not a lot of benefits to eating sugar. Um, sugar is also a genetically modified food unless it's cane sugar. People, a lot of people don't know that. So there's a lot of negative pieces on sugar. Uh, but if people eat fruit or something in, in, instead, I find that it really lessens the pain of it because you're getting the same benefit. You're just getting it in a healthy way. So if you're eating you know, four or five pieces of fruit a day, you're still getting a good dosage of that same feel good um, serotonin, but you're, but you're not getting it in the way that's negative for your body. So I would say it's very individual. And with food, as with anything, I don't think there's a should. Everybody's body is different. And so the more that you can tune into what your body wants, how your body feels, not only when you eat, but a half an hour later, two hours later, how did that sit for you? What are you noticing? Just like emotions, how am I? Staying connected to what the impact was of that piece of food or that piece of fruit on my body will tell a lot and really support you in your own body's health and healing. 
I, uh, I noticed that in your book, uh, the pause and choice and being aware is, uh, is, is occurring on and on. And I really enjoyed this. So I, I had, I have on my fridge and in my kitchen, um, a post-it that says, uh, pause, what choice do you have? Mm -hmm. And are you present? <laughs> So it, it really helps me to, to be more conscious. Also, I have a problem with saying no um, to food and especially uh, to people who offer me food as a way to show their love. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm talking especially about my mother, mm -hmm. uh, but there are other people in my life who want to feed me. <laughs> How, how can I tell them no uh, by also taking care of their needs? Hmm. So what need keeps you from saying yes? I'm full. Mm -hmm. so I, I'm full or, or I want to, or I want to a healthier version. Hmm. So what about if you tell them that, you know, I really, I really get your intention, your hope to really, want to nurture me, that that's really important to you and really show your love. And I'm wondering if we can maybe play with other ways that you could show your love that would also work better for me. Are you yeah. willing to explore that? I tried something like this with my mother, but with my dad, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take, take another stick. <laughs> oh. Take those, yes. Yeah, so it's probably an easy way for him, right? It might be yeah. just the easiest way to share to share love. Yeah, I had a similar story with my father. He would once, maybe once or twice a year, he would make pancakes or he'd make some kind of, he'd make mamalega, actually. And <laughs> that was his job. And so if I didn't have two or three helpings, he'd say, what, you don't like it? So it became, it became a way to... Uh, yeah, to use food to try to get me to eat more. And I would say, well, how many helpings would I need to eat to show you that I actually really liked it? So we would play with that around food. Oh, I like that strategy. Yeah. <laughs> to ask him specifically how many helping, helpings would help <laughs> to get his, his needs met. Yeah. No. yeah. Or what can, yeah, what can I do to share with you that I do really value what you offer? Yeah, I really want to share that appreciation. And I'm really taking in your love, even if I'm not eating as many helpings as you'd like. Yeah. From your point of view, what is better uh, to, to lead by example or express your concern about your loved one's weight? Uh, I would say both for me. Um, people definitely see watch you people watch and notice uh, and sometimes they see it as looking at what they're doing looking at what you're doing comparing the difference and then feeling bad about themselves so i've noticed that because i have a pretty healthy diet people will hear judgment even if i don't have it uh, because they're eating very differently so i would generally express concern about what's going on for me in what I'm seeing, as well as living my life the way I do, because I love that phrase that you probably heard me say, um, live and let me watch rather than teaching me how to live. Yeah, I remember that thing of your... Mm -hmm. uh, do people ask you how do you keep your, uh, your weight? Because um, I guess you, you are complimented uh, very often. Uh, and also, do you advise to have a certain weight as a, as a goal? I don't, you know, there's a whole chart that people can follow if they want. Um, I would say much more, how do you feel in your body? Do you feel at home in your body? Are you comfortable? Is there parts of you that aren't able to move very well because of weight that might be getting in the way? So really much more of an, in, you know, internal process about how you are. You know, am I wanting to lose weight because I think I should or because of the chart? Or is it really because I feel best in a body that I can move easily with or in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's people that I know that 
from looking at them, you would say, well, they don't look very healthy. But if you see their lab tests or you see how they move, they're quite happy and quite agile. So I don't, again, I don't think it's a one size fits all. I think it's really where, where your comfort is and how your health is. And if that's important to you, what you might want to do to support that. I agree. Also, uh, uh, regarding that uh, one size doesn't fit all, um, what would you say to someone who is very confused about all the information on the internet regarding the best lifestyle? Um, let's say they are not looking for a diet, just a lifestyle. Can you share three, four principles to start and not feel overwhelmed? Mm. Well, I like Michael Pollan's work, you know, about eating fresh foods that can go bad, but before they do. So that's a principle that I like to follow. Um, and I, you know, for me, eating is about enjoyment. So eating foods that you enjoy. I remember one of my clients um, that's since passed, but she said, you know, you can never, you can never get enough of a bad thing. So in other words, if it's, if it's chocolate that really isn't very healthy, you can keep eating and eating and eating and it'll never be satisfying. So find that which is really satisfying and then enjoy a piece of that, whatever that is. Um, so to me, it's not about deprivation. It's about noticing what really works for you. Um, and, you know, if you eat probably two out of three meals with some, with some vegetables, something green, something alive, you know, and eat enough protein for your body to function well, that you wake up in the morning and have energy. So again, it's much more noticing inside what does it for you. Can I pinpoint what's working, what's not working? And notice when I feel energetic and when I feel exhausted. Again, being present and being present. Yeah, not much difference from NVC, but just putting that strategy to food. Because even though food is a need, it's often a strategy as well to meet other needs. So we often find ourselves in the refrigerator after we've just had a meal because something, maybe we had a fight with our friend or our boss said something we're triggered by. So how do we then notice what's going on so that we can really make a choice from a conscious place rather than a habitual place? Yeah, I have a problem with this being um, conscious and taking care of my needs. And also there's uh, some experts say to eat in the morning to have breakfast because breakfast uh, they say is the most important meal of the day. Uh, and on the other hand, sometimes in the morning, I'm not hungry once I wake up. So I would tend to not eat until lunch. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of that, on that? And how can I introduce MVC to these two? Yeah. You know, I've been, I've been playing with that lately because I've been reading studies where for blood sugar, um, sometimes fasting is actually really healthy for your blood sugar. So I, like you, was brought up with the idea that breakfast is the most important meal. And I would say when I work with people that often when they're not hungry in the morning, it's because maybe they ate later in night or maybe they were snacking till later. So often if you eat a dinner at six, seven o'clock, you're likely, your body will likely be hungry in the morning. So I don't know if that's true for you, if you're eating later meals or snacking later at night, but I find that that's often the reason people aren't hungry in the morning. Yes, I usually eat later at nine o'clock because otherwise I wake up at two or three in the morning and can't sleep at all after mm. that. So yeah. I have later dinner. Yeah, so that would make sense that you might not be hungry then till lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Generally, a 12-hour fast is really helpful for our body. So if we eat at 6, to eat again in the morning at 6 or 7 to 7. Um, but again, you might be different. So noticing your body and how you feel, noticing those signals, because your body gives you signals when it's hungry. Your stomach might be growling. You might notice you're getting lightheaded. Uh, you yeah. might need some water more than food. People often mistake food, needing food for needing water. Yeah, I agree with that. Your book was published in 2005. 
now after all these years? Would you change anything in it or add? Oh, I like the question. I've changed a few things probably maybe five years ago when I, when I, did, a, I did a little bit of editing and, and changed a few things. Um, I'm always reading and changing, so likely I would. I'm not exactly sure what that would be at this moment. I think generally I like what was written, uh, but there might be some new ideas that I would add, some new ideas around food. Uh, it's definitely a topic that I'm continually researching. Any cookbook in the future from you? Uh, yes, one that I'm hoping to, and I, I hesitate, hesitate to say because I'm not sure when and how it'll happen, but Stephanie bachman Mate and, and I are working on a, on a project on key distinctions, um, writing a book on key distinctions. So we, um, we're not very far in yet, but it's something we're both very passionate about and offering for certification candidates right now. We actually are in the middle of a class. Actually, I was, I, I was asking about a book with recipes. Ah, a book with recipes. I know you have a booklet, but a book with more oh. recipes and also MVC included in it. Mm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that and it hasn't yet come to fruition, but uh, that's definitely a possibility. The problem with me with recipes is things kind of change every moment when I make it. So for me to actually write something down and say, this is the recipe, uh, that's a hard one. Uh, it, it doesn't say stay static for long. I might change things as I do it. And I'm kind of a throwing this and throwing that in. So uh, it's, it's not very consistent, which would make it very hard for somebody to read. Um, but I do like that idea. And I have played with that idea of how to do a, a fun NBC cookbook. So it might just be that. Well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Sylvia, what would you tell your 20-year-old self if you, would, if you could say, this is something you might want to keep in mind? Hmm. That's a fun question. You know, I'm, I'm not so sure because in some ways, I think when I was younger, um, more of my life was together than it is today. It's funny how that is. Um, I think at 17, I was probably more mature than I am today. So I'm not so sure what I would tell myself or if I would unlearn some of the stuff that I've learned. Uh, maybe it'd be more about just, you know, play and spontaneity and just letting life go and just being with yourself, with how you are. Just knowing that, just trusting, trusting in the process of life. On the same note, what is the best advice you've ever received? Mm. Even when you stand alone, you can still belong to yourself. Wow, very powerful. Mm. We, we approach the end of the interview. I have three more questions uh, for you. Uh, you said that um, you also have uh, in working a project about key differentiations. Any other things? What are you doing at the moment? And do you have any plans in development? Um, I'm working on a nine day training for certification candidates. So the team that I work with, the CAF program, Candidates Active Learning Forum, we have a nine day program in May in Virginia for people from all over the world and candidates working with any assessor. So we're really excited about that. And we're not doing it through the center because the center, their IITs are always open to anybody. And this is actually open to only candidates. And we're doing that because we really want people to have a more intensive and a higher level of training and support. And we're hoping that it'll give candidates also connections with people from all over the world to be able to play together as colleagues as they continue to, to train and share NBC. So we're really excited about that. We're gonna to cook together. So you asked about recipes and we're gonna, we're gonna create that as we go and really uh, cook together. So we're excited about all the possibilities. We'll really live NBC on a higher level. So the rooming and all that will be a shared experience. It's not gonna be done ahead of time. Uh, the money will also be done in a shared experience in a money dance. So it's really living NBC in all, all levels, all aspects. 
Wow, they check so MVC and to put in practice live. Live, exactly. It sounds really exciting. Yeah. So that's one big thing. And we're offering more and more classes from, from CAF. So we're also thinking about a journaling class because people struggle in the certification process with how do I journal and what sense do I make and what are my assessors really looking for? So we're going to probably do a journaling class coming up soon. Uh, so we're offering many different, uh, many different things just to support whatever kind of academy we can share in offering candidate support in moving forward. Any online classes? These are all online. Yeah, the, the key distinctions are online. The journaling class will be online. There's a mentoring program that one of our staff, Ann Walton, is doing as a mentor. So anything anybody can dream up, any desires they have, they just put it out to us and we create something. For someone who uh, doesn't know about MVC, how would you explain what MVC is? if they never heard of it yet? I would say it's back to Marshall's two questions. You know, how do I, it, it's about bringing joy back to giving and receiving in asking those two questions. How are you? And how can I make life more wonderful for you? Yeah. And the last question, what is your vision you hold for the world and the world and the role that NBC could play in it? Mm. Well, the role I see NBC could play in the world in being a more compassionate place and certainly some of the healing that needs to happen um, based on what's happening in the world right now. Um, I see NBC touching lives in ways that's, that's, that's incredibly healing. You know, healing for ourselves internally, healing for the planet. So I find the more that people share this consciousness and whether it's NBC or something else, just with presence and being with, and supporting healing, uh, we need it right now more than ever, as I can see. And so my hope is that uh, we'll grow, continue to grow and spread as we have. It's pretty amazing how much we've grown. There's, I think, 550 candidates right now, and there's many, many more people that are sharing NBC that aren't certified or aren't going towards certification. So I see it happening. There's, there's lots more, even what's happening in this country, in this world, there are so many seeds of compassion that are being planted and spread. So I do really have a lot of hope for the world as a more compassionate, loving place. That's so touching, Sylvia. Mm. Thank you for being with us and uh, sharing your time and wisdom with us. I'm really grateful for you to, uh, that you are here. <laughs> Thank you. Very fun and I'm excited to hear you're on the certification path. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes, I, I started in uh, uh, at the end of 2016. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up, share it with a friend, and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Check the description of this video for links and details about Sylvia and us, and see you next time.